welcome those of you that are here tonight in the name of Christ, as well as those that are on live stream. We enjoy this fellowship in the truth. We're in the book of Amos. This will be our 28th lesson in this uh, study. I don't really like the word lessons in study. I, I have to think of an alternative there. I don't like the, either one of those words. <laughs> so I, I apologize that I have used them and I prefer to use something better. Now there's a certain fact that has escaped the attention of many if not most that God assesses his people. <clears throat> I don't think many people know this, not many Christian people. I don't think they know this, that God assesses, evaluates, judges his people. I do know it's very rarely affirmed with power. Very rarely will you hear anyone talk about this or minister about it. And as a consequence, those who live at a distance from God practice sin. They may not even know it. But when you don't know God, you sin. This is just the truth of the matter. That's why this is so critical. Now, you'd think that anyone that's scripturally knowledgeable, which is, of course, the, <laughs> the area of question, would know that there's so much information on this in Scripture that a person has to really be deliberately and willingly ignorant to overlook it. That God evaluates, judges, critiques his people. In fact, he is noted as a God of judgment. And in another text, Malachi, is called the God of judgment. Even Solomon, who had wisdom under the sun, a lower, he had a lower strata of wisdom. Even he knew the Lord weighs spirits. As he said in Proverbs 16, 2, or says, or weighs motives. <laughs> that should really frighten some people. God considers why people do things as well as what they do. He assessed Israel to the prophets. He can't read the prophets without seeing this evaluation that God's forming of his people. He did it through John the Baptist. He did this. Jesus did this. The apostles did this. In fact, after Jesus went back to glory, he evaluated the seven churches of Asia. He gave a critique of the seven churches in Asia. Paul assessed the church at Corinth. He assessed the church at Galatia. The 12 tribes that were scattered, James assessed them in his epistle, judged them. Hebrew believers were judged and assessed. Jude judged certain believers who had to be stirred up to earnestly contend for the faith. See, this is every place in, every place in God's word. Where people have not advanced, there's a reason. This is not normal. In the kingdom of God, a failure to grow up into Christ is not normal. But it is normal in the church, the professed church. This is normal. It's every place there's a church, this condition exists. If you don't believe it, you try and find one where it doesn't. And you may be able to do so. We don't say you can't, but you will have to work at it. You go over the seas and you'll find it. You go in the educated countries, you find it. You go in the third world countries, you find it. You go to Canada and you find it. Huh? You go into America, you find it. Which means people don't live with this keen sensitivity that the eye of God is upon me. 
He's evaluated me. The gospel has been preached and accepted that allows people to live without thinking about God. That's what the, that's what the problem is. That's what the problem with Israel, too. Same thing. Think of the advantages. If, if God didn't excuse Israel <laughs> and, and they didn't have the better things, what is he going to do with a church that's been, that has received such a bountiful blessings and great measures have been given the power of the Holy Spirit, have been placed in a body in which spiritual gifts exist that can nurture them? How's God going to look at a church or a body or a person who doesn't advance under those conditions? Well, you want to be able to tra make the transition from Amos to now. Amen. <laughs> in our text tonight, the Lord requires men to seek him in truth. This is a, this is a requirement. And no one is, has found as much of God as can be found. See, so this, this seeking thing doesn't end, no matter how long you're here. Amos 5, verses 10 through 12. He's assessing it, his own people. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them, Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Well, actually, there's a lot of that that goes on. But see, God, wherever there is a body of people, among whom God is communicating with somebody, they'll talk like this. This will happen. There's some representative from God that'll speak up wherever someone does it. That's not a church. It's a make-believe. It's, it's not even real. We should refuse to call it a church. Call it a club organization, something else. It's not a church. Any more than Israel could have been Israel without these prophets. See, wherever God has a people and God is working, he raises up these, right. these men. So where they're not raised up, we've not got anything to work with. That's what the problem is. Well, or what are you going to say about Israel? You certainly did a lot for them. Now he's going to judge them first about uh, concerning how they responded to his messengers. That'd be his first evaluation here. Notice he says they. Yeah. They. Speaking to Israel, he doesn't say my people that are called by my name. He call, he, say, he does say that. Some he doesn't say that here. Yeah. He doesn't say uh, the children of Israel. See, he does, he does say it a little bit out here. He says, they, they. It's a word for the whole nation. They. Yeah. You've become a them. <laughs> they had become a them. Yeah. Or a they. That's about as impersonal now as you can get. But this is how God ad addresses him. That's, that's almost oppositional. You know, the us right. and them idea. Amen. We're not the same. That's right. And they they hate him that rebuke him. That's right. Yeah. See, it's, it's another, it's not associated yeah. with God. That's right. God speaking to them as people that had no practical association with him. By, by divine imposition, so to speak, they had an association with him, but it wasn't one he initiated. It isn't one that they pursued. They had no practical. That is to say, their religion didn't work itself out in life. 
they had right positions. Their theology was good, I suppose, for the most part, at least among those who were learned. But they were practically, in practice, they were alienated from God. Now, you tell me if this isn't the type of thing we, we're, we're facing. Not, not we here. I mean, we Christians face this in our world, in our country, and in our town, in our state. We face this. We face people that say they're of God, but if they didn't say it, you'd never think it. You would never imagine they had a connection with God. If they didn't say, I'm a Christian, you'd have never known it otherwise, which leads to the suspicion of whether they are or not. <clears throat> they, they, they hate, well, that's a strong word. Some people don't like that word. They hate one Bible called say they detested. They detested. As used here, the word hate means intense hostility and aversion. Extreme dislike and antipathy. Extreme enmity. Dislike, scorn, disapproval, resentment, disdain, begrudge. It's a very strong word. This wasn't just, I'd rather hear someone else. This, it was, <laughs> you have a right to your opinion. This wasn't that kind of thing. They hated, there's a clash of persons here. The person that's speaking in the gate, rebuking in the gate, wasn't their kind of person. He was in conflict with them. They were different kind of people. kind of hate mentioned here is nearly always associated with what somebody said. Almost always. The Lord Jesus said the world hated him. He said the world hates me because I testify of it that his works are evil. Amen. So he, he, he told you why. If Jesus just hadn't said anything. If people had rather see a sermon than hear one any time, Jesus would have never said a word. Right. Never everybody been happy. But that's just old folklore. That, that isn't true. People read, how do you see a sermon? How exactly is that done? You have the wrong definition of sermon. That's right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so it's what they said. So he's going to deal with what they said. If they hadn't said anything, let me tell you something. If you never say anything, there's not really that much difference between you and the world. Uh, you can compare yourself with the with the people way down there in the gutter. I understand, I understand that, but see, everybody's not way down there in a moral gutter. But if you're not saying something, there really isn't any real way to tell whether you're of Christ. Yeah. You say, "Let your light so shine that may see your good works." Jesus, said, part of your good works is what what come out of your mouth, the way you speak. They hate him that rebukes in the in the gate. This is Isaiah 29, 21. That make a man an offender yeah, for, for a word, for a word yeah. and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, That's and right. turn aside the just for a thing of naught. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Like when um, in, the, in Proverbs it says to have respect of persons is not good, for for a piece of bread that man will transgress. That's right. What does a person value? Yeah. It comes out and look at you. Amen. Amen. The rebukes to the gate. Now the gate, that was the place where public proclamations were made, judgments were made, announcements were made. The king of Judah and Jehoshaphat, the king, uh, king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, they, they held a court like in the gate and the prophets prophesied at the time. It stated in 1 Kings 22.10, And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Yes. He was, <laughs> what the prophets were saying wasn't like complimentary. Uh, yeah. They hated him that rebuked in the gate. Yeah. Oh, what are you doing here? In Amos, the judgments that were being declared by the kings were corrupt. 
And the prophets spoke up, mm -hmm. <laughs> spoke against it. See, now the news media would criticize ministers of the gospel for speaking against decisions that government makes. They, they, why do they do that? Because they hate him that rebukes in the gate. <laughs> See, we, There is a ministry that is valid that is rebuking in the gate where the people are mingling and the people are crossing paths and there's things that need to be said where the people are. So rather than giving heed to these men of God, the people re hated him. Rebuked him. They hated him that rebuked in the gate publicly. In the gate publicly. Someone said, well, if you really want to say something to me, come to me privately. I've had people say that to me. Say, well, you sin publicly? We're coming to talk about it publicly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They sin privately? All right. We'll, we'll go privately and talk to you. But people stick sin out in front of us. We'll talk about it in the public. Amen. In the public. Amen. The leader of the synagogue there spoke up and said, come on some other day. Yeah. Jesus let him have it right That's in front right. of everybody. Right, yeah. Humiliated him right Amen. in front of everybody. Amen. Yeah, it's, you, it's kind of a, it seems like it's an obvious principle, but a lot of people don't don't see this. Go ahead, Brother Robin. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it, <laughs> well, when people are irritated by the truth, that, that really should be an indication to them that they should examine themselves. That's right. Because what, 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 if, if indeed what you're saying is true, then it, it really it has to be received or you fall into this kind of condition. That's right. Uh -huh. If a person doesn't see it's the truth, that's what sin does to you. Sin does that to you. When you indulge in sin, your spiritual sensitivities grow weak, and you can't you can't distinguish good from evil, and you end up hating what's good and loving what's bad. They hate him that rebukes in the gate, and they abhor him. They, another strong word, they abhor him that speaks uprightly. They despise him. Basic Bible English says he's disgusting. The one that speaks uprightly is disgusting. Oh. They are disgusted with him. They detest him. They abominate him. They speak evil against him. Why? Because he says what's right. He just, all he's doing is saying what's right. Yeah. They abhor him. He doesn't say the people disliked or abhorred what he said. Uh -huh. notice, what he, uh -huh. <laughs> notice what he says here. He doesn't say they hated what he said. They hated the one that said it. Not just what he said, the one that said it. Why? Because you can't divorce what a person says from the person. Amen. They're tied. Yes. They are tied together. The speaker can't be divorced from what he says, not in the sight of God and not even in the sight of men. Mm -hmm. yes. If a person speaks things that are loose, it's because they're a loose person. They speak things that aren't true, it's because they're a false. Yeah. They're a liar, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. They're a liar by nature. That's why they say things that aren't right. Well, they didn't know they were they didn't know they weren't right. That doesn't change the fact, brother, that it was a lie. Yeah. That's right. Amen. If their hearts are pure, God'll kind of speak to you mm -hmm. and alert you. Mm -hmm. You'll have some sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Better not oh. better not say that. I got to look into this a little more. See, that's what happens when a person lives close to the Lord. He asked the Lord to put a watch on his mouth. Put a watch on my mouth. Let me be careful what I, yes. what I say. When Jeremiah faced the rejection of the people, he took it up with God. He just he didn't go home and like cry. Yeah. He took it up with God. Listen to what he said. Jeremiah 17, 16. Behold, they say to me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. Yes, for me, I have hastened, I have not hastened from being a pastor. And that's in the King James. I have not hastened from being a pastor. The Amplified Bible says, I have not sought to escape from being a shepherd after you. 
I've not hasted from being a pastor to follow thee, neither have I desired the woeful day. Like I'm prophesying about doom, I'm not like looking forward to doom. I mean, yeah. Thou knowest that what came out of my lips was right. Yes. Neither have I desired the woeful day. That what came out of my lips was right. He then pled with the Lord on that, on that basis. He said, Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me. Amen. But let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed. Let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with a double destruction. That doesn't sound right. Well, God didn't rebuke them. Instead of take, taking things into your own hands or running away, uh -huh. yes. this is what you should do. Amen. Psalmist prayed this kind of thing. He said they break their teeth in their mouth. Yeah. That's what he, he said. Yeah. Yes. Reminds me. Speak up, brother Jim. It was it was the Israelites that had false prophets told them, "Speak to us what we want to hear." They had itching ears, so yeah. they only would hear what they wanted to hear, what they thought was good. Yeah. People, people today, they they claim that they want a word from the Lord, but then a word from the Lord comes through a man who is speaking uprightly, and if they don't want to accept it, they won't acknowledge that it came from God, or they'll just outright reject it. Yeah. But God's word, it is spirit and it is truth. It is spirit and it is life. So whatever it is, if it's a blessing, if it's a judgment, if it's a condemnation, eat any of those ways, it is a word from God, and it is spirit, and it is life. Mm. Yes. Yeah, if, if you ever encountered this, so, some of you have encountered this, I know. This is in order to pray like Jeremiah. You'll get a lot of relief. Yes, that's right. From the development of bitterness and things like this. In other words, cast your burden. Amen. See, upon the Lord. There are people in the professed church that can't bear to think like Jeremiah did. They would rebuke you. If you said something like this, they would rebuke you, say it's wrong. They would want us to learn to live with these people. But Paul says their mouths must be stopped. You say, well, I can't stop them. Well, then pray that God would stop them. Some, they're whose mouths must be stopped. That's what he said contrary things see God is really against those that hate yeah. and abhor the one who correctly rebukes them and speaks righteously God yeah. God has an attitude toward those kind of people and it's not a good one it tells you that, that the rebuke is the answer That's right. it's, it's not like these men are just trying to cause trouble something had been said or done that was wrong and it needed to be rebuked. That's right. And so these men, they stood up, they did what God told them to do, and and they were willing to pay the price for doing it. Amen. Now perhaps we should say a word about this doesn't sanction nitpicking. No. No. You can nitpick and about things that aren't of a critical nature. Mm -hmm. They're not right, but mm -hmm. there's some things you it, it just because people are ignorant. So, so this isn't saying you're looking for every little speck. You that's know? right. That, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about people that are declaring things that sway how people think. Mm -hmm. People are teaching things that determine how people think. Mm -hmm. Brother Jason has reported to us a condition that exists universally about preachers that hardly know anything. Mm -hmm. All right, now who produced that situation? They need to be rebuked. Yeah, that's right. If there's some books, they need to be confiscated and burned. Telling you the truth now. That's that's what a re he that rebukes in the gate. This is the type of things he's doing. He's getting he's getting rid of the source of the source of the trouble. When the people at Corinth had a fornicator among them. Paul told him, get him out of there. Yeah. He didn't say convert him. Mm -hmm. He didn't say pray for him. 
Why not? All had already been done. He was in the church. He committed a sin while he's in the church, so he'd already he'd already been addressed. To fail to do the, do that, they would become God's opponent. So he thought, get him out. And until you get him out, he won't change. Amen. Well, they got him out, and he changed. Amen. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. There are some people that there's nothing anybody else can do for them. No matter how powerful an intercessor they are, no matter how powerful a preacher they are, there are some people that are beyond the help of any mortal, no matter how godly they are, no matter how close they are to God, no matter how powerful their prayers are, there are some people that can't be helped by a mortal. So God says, cut him loose so only I can work with him. That's, that's the logic behind, behind this. So if you... Some people have spent years, decades, trying to change somebody. Now it's time to quit doing that. Turn them over to God. Amen. Refuse to answer their questions. Refuse to give them aid. Refuse to help them. They what if they're starving? All right, you give them a glass of milk and some bread. We're not talking about that type of thing. If your enemy is hungry, feed them. But there are people, they've got to be, the church has got to back off or they're not going to be saved. Now, that's not every sinner thing. <laughs> that's, every sinner is not like that. We all understand it, I hope. This isn't your, your first option. This is the last option. Aggressive against the truth. That's, that's right. right. Like hand and eye. That's right. Who confronted Jeremiah and slapped yes. it. That's right. And broke the yoke off his back when Jeremiah was using it as an illustration. That's right. You remember what happened oh, to him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sixty days he was dead. Yeah. If you have a difficult time applying this, then don't try and do it. This is an area you can't afford to make mistakes in. You've got to see this, the truth of this. You've got to see this, have some discernment of the case, be able to recognize hardened sinners, be able to recognize it. Hardened sinners are people you can't stop their, their descent. You can't stop it. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse no matter what you do. There comes a time you've got to back off and turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Then God comes in. He knows how to deal with people like that. Amen. And that fornicator did repent. <clears throat> yes? What you just said um, a few minutes ago about um, trying to um, convert somebody for 10 or 20 years, how we shouldn't do that. In Matthew 10, verse 14, it says, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor fear your words, when yeah. you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. That's right. And you do this, incidentally, you do this knowing that everything doesn't really depend on you. Amen. See, so this doesn't, this doesn't mean no work will ever be done, but Amen. I trust everyone can see that. All right, so here's the one. I'm, uh, he says, you, you hate him that rebukes in the gate, and you, uh, you abhor the one that's, that's speaking what's right. For as much, therefore, for as much. For as much. It's a good word, for as much. Other versions read, therefore, or so because, or truly, or that is why, or assuredly, or on account of, or therefore because, and so that is why. So be this is a reasoning word that's going to explain why people do what they do. Now, in this text, he's going to say they pillage the poor so they could build these fancy houses. He's going to tell you why they why they treated the poor, why they didn't listen to the prophets and treated the poor like they did. He's going to tell you why. It's a reasoning word. For as much doctrinally it would be saying whatsoever a man sows that shall he also reap. See doctrinally that's how you, that would be stated. The modern church needs to be more aware of this. I don't think there's enough 
consciousness on this matter that you reap what you sow. You sow to the flesh, of the flesh you reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, of the spirit you'll reap life everlasting. But I, I would love to be wrong on this, but I don't think I am. I don't think this is generally known or that is recognized because there's too many, too much sowing to the flesh. There's too much of this going on. It's owing to the flesh doesn't necessarily mean like adultery, theft, murder, drunkenness. So to the flesh, that's like the bottom, that's like the bottom of that type of sin. But that's not, there's some pretty sophisticated ways you can sow to the flesh. You can spend yourself for a career. What is that? It's so under the flesh. See? You can adopt a religion that's convenient. Yeah. What is that? It's so to the flesh. That's what that is. Now here's what they did. They tread upon the poor. You tread down the poor. New American Standard says you impose heavy rent on the poor. The NIV says you trample on the poor. The Douay Reigns version says the poor man's crust under your feet. Basic Bible language. The Douay says you rob the poor. Now these actions are going to be how God saw the this isn't how it looked on earth. This the, the sinners didn't think this is what they were doing, but this is how God saw it. They're described, these people are described as stomping on the poor when they already were down. Israel as a whole had been oppressing the poor by imposing requirements on them that brought grief and sorrow. Remember in Nehemiah's day they did this. Nehemiah had to rebuke the people. He called them in the, the chieftains in. They'd been imposing taxes on their brethren. And he really, really got on their case about this. That's what he's talking about. That sort of thing is what he's talking about here. Treading on the poor. Now the law strictly forbade this. And remember, they agreed. They agreed they'd keep the law. All that the Lord has said, we will do. All right, here's what it said. Exodus 23, uh, Deuteronomy 24, 14. Thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in the land within thy gates. Don't you make it hard for people that already are struggling. Don't you do it. And several times, when you reap your fields, leave the corners now for the poor. And during the land Sabbath, whatever grows, if it's on the core, don't, don't reap it, leave it for the poor, see. So the law taught them, have, have regard now for the poor. Life is hard enough for them. Jesus said, the poor you always have with you. So the God made no provision for the elimination of the poor. Amen. How did they tread on the poor? Well, he, go, he elaborates. You take from them burdens of wheat. That was a, a form of taxation. That's what Nehemiah faced. It was a taxation that took some of the grain from the people. Because the Israelites were an agricultural people. Other versions say take grain taxes from them or exact a tribute of grain or force him to give you grain or take from him levies of grain and take from him exactions of wheat, the Amplified says. He just got a little garden, just, just barely eking out of existence. He just has enough wheat to support him. And what do you do? You tax him. You make him give a big portion of that wheat to you. Take burdens from them. Micah, the second chapter, says this, verses 1 and 2. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon the, their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in, it is in their power in, of their hand. And they covet fields and take them by force and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. What little bit he has, that little ewe lamb. Yeah, yeah. Remember that, that little ewe lamb that Nathan told David about? 
One poor man had one little ewe lamb. This man had flocks of lambs. He took that and fed his... They were doing this. Officials were doing this in Israel. Leaders in Israel. Treading on the poor. You know, one time when Israel was in bondage in Egypt, Egypt tread on them. Remember that? They weren't wealthy when they were in Egypt. Egypt made it hard for them. God told Moses, the people have cried out to me, and I have heard them, and I'm going to come and deliver them. You know, James addressed this problem in the church. In the church, James addressed this very problem. James 5, 4. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Lord of hosts. Sabbath means Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts. Say, you haven't paid them for their work. They were poor already. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's make this downright practical. You know who the lowest paid people in the world are? Aside from religious opportunists, I'm excluding them, is Christian ministries. It's churches that pay their ministers meager salaries. It's Christian colleges that give people lower than a minimum income. This stuff is still going on. In the name of the Lord. These people probably had good excuses they could give you for this. Did you know every casino and every lottery operates on this fraudulent principle? Take it from the poor. All casinos, all lotteries, and all gamers, they all operate on this principle. They take from people that precious little as it is, and they take it to themselves. What do they do with it? What do they do with it? Well, instead of Israel... He had built houses of hewn stone. That's what these taxes they levied on the poor. Hewn stones. That's well, one New American Standard says, well hewn stones. They were fancy stones. You built stone mansions. The NIV says, carved stones. Polished houses, beautiful stone houses, luxury homes. They were prestigious homes. You look at these houses, you say, whoa, boy, that is some house. Just look at one, just look at one of Oral Roberts' houses. You'd say, whoa, boy. And to think he's got three of them. Some of them have seven, eight, nine, ten of them. What did they build them with? Huh? What did they build them with? They trod on the poor. 19, uh, 1980, I ministered in India. And when I arrived there, the uh, elders and spiritual leaders wanted to talk with me in a, in a closed session. Just before I had come, Kenneth Copeland had ministered there to about 600,000 people in the audiences. Uh, in India, the people are pretty well all poor. And they have a few rupees. A rupee takes eight rupees. At that time, it took eight rupees to make one penny in the U.S. money. Little tiny coin. So these Indian people that came to the meetings would have a few rupees, maybe three, four, five, ten. And over a period of 10 days, Pastor Copeland got all those rupees. And the spiritual leaders were angry. They said, are you going to do that? Are you going to take offerings? I said, I'm not going to take any offerings. I'm, I brought you money. My own money. I earned this money. Myself. I brought it. It was in the thousands. It wasn't a little dinky offering. And they cleared me to, to speak. See, they experienced this. 
There's still people experience this, brother. There's people experience this. There's people in, in the ghettos where people hardly have enough to live on. There'll be a church there that boggles your mind how big it is and preacher driving the Cadillac. It, it, this, this is still happening. Yeah. See, God, God sees all this. You built these, these fancy houses and you, you made some vineyards, some very pleasant vineyards with the resources taken from the poor. Pleasant vineyards, that's lush vineyards, beautiful vineyards, desirable vineyards, a lot of fruit. Just as you walk by, you say, oh, look at that. Wouldn't that be nice to have a vineyard like that? They were built and planted at the expense of the poor. Now, there are some people that have built legitimately. I mean, they've got nice houses and that, but they've earned their income legitimately. See, so we, we're not talking about that kind of thing. Now, the edict comes down from heaven about these houses and these vineyards. You're not going to dwell in the houses. And you're not going to drink vine, wine from the vineyards. Is it, now, God determined this. There is no way. They built the houses, and they, I don't know whether they just fell down from rot or what, but they didn't live in them. God made sure that didn't happen. You will not live in them. <coughs> God reacted to these actions of men. Yet, see, these men had forgotten what they'd seen and heard. They'd forgotten what they'd seen and heard. Yeah. Why? Because they lived in sin. And when sin dominates your life, it wipes your memory clean. Amen. It's like an erasing of the memory. That's what happens when you live in sin. You can't remember what God did. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's more, you don't want to remember what God did. That's why these men did this. That's why they had the nerve to impose hardships on the poor. That's why they had a nerve to do it, to hate him that spoke in the gate, to hate him that rebuked and spoke uprightly. That's why they had the gall to do that is because they didn't think in terms of God doesn't like this. God is against this. God had shown all through their history that he didn't condone this type of thing. Now God speaks to them. See, he told them what they really did. If you were to ask one of these men, how are you able to build that fancy house and plant that beautiful vineyard? None of them would have said, I tread on the poor. Yeah. None of them would have said that. They'd have said, well, I earned it. I earned it. It's just come from my funds. I earned it. But God told them the way it really was. Then he continued, I know. Now, this is my own personal persuasion. But I don't think many people think about God knowing. That isn't their concept of God, an intelligent God that knows. I know. I know. David said, Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. <laughs> You know everything about me, you know, aside from everything else. You know. The psalmist said, the Lord knows the thoughts of man that they're vanity. He knows what people are thinking. When Jesus was on earth, he knew what people were thinking. What do you know, Lord? I know your manifold transgressions. Other versions read, your transgressions are many. That's New American Standard. NIV says, how great your sins. Basic Bible English says, how your evil doings is increased. The Century Bible says, how many are your crimes? Jerusalem Bible says, how numerous. Net Bible says, your numerous sins. See, I think those are all bad translations. I don't think they've said what really is meant here. The word manifold is more extensive than these, That's right. Amen. Than these versions suggest. Yes. As used in this text, uh -huh. if you want, you want like a dictionary definition, 
It's abundant in quantity, size, age, number, rank, quality, and etc. See, so manifold. Well, in the Greek language, manifold means much variegated, marked with great variety. So it's a different, That's right. yes. different kinds. Manifold transgressions are different kinds of transgressions, different classes of, uh -huh. of uh, transgressions. In the English, it means, manifold means with great variety, marked by diversity or variety. Now, this confirms to us that all sin is really not the same. That's right. All sin is not like. There could not be a variety of sin if all sin was equal. So the people say, look, it's just as wrong to eat too much food as it is to commit adultery. I mean, I've heard this said. Fortunately, it's, I don't hear it as much anymore, but this is not right. Amen. It's just as bad. Yeah. And then they name something they do as it is to right. commit adultery. Yeah. Well, but this isn't so. This is not so. <coughs> there is such a thing as, John 19, 11, the greater sin. This is, this is Jesus. The psalmist spoke of the great transgression. And Jesus spoke of a sin that shall never be forgiven him, neither in this world nor the world to come. So you can't read that, things like that, and say, all sin's the same. All sin is wrong, in that sense it's the same. All sin is inexcusable, in that sense it's the same, but it's not classed the same. The sin of the Pharisee is a lot worse than the sin of the publican. Yes. Yeah, yes. It wasn't that these men or these people just made a mistake or they just made a bad decision. Yeah. This was like a strategy. This was something that was thought out and was well planned and put into place, and and they were looking for the return on their on their on what they were doing. They they knew what they were doing to the poor people. That's right. That's right. See, they didn't regard the poor people. Yeah. They had no respect for them. Even the law said, "No, yeah. respect the poor and be merciful toward them, because he's got enough against him already." They didn't. Yeah. They didn't do that at all. Keep in mind, these were the people who, prior to the coming of Christ, had received more than anyone on the face of the earth or in time. He has received more. And the principle still holds, to whom much is given, much is required. Now, to those in Christ, whether they know it or not, they've been given more and preceding generations. Yep. And God expects more of them than he got from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right. and Joseph. Mm -hmm. And he got a lot from them. These are not to be your heroes. Uh -huh. yes. If anything, they look at you as their heroes. Yeah. Uh -huh. See, we've been given more. Yeah. We've got to respond better. Our response must be more instant than Abraham's response. More thorough. And he was pretty good. He's held out as the model. Jesus said, well, he's a model in the sense that he believed. In that sense, he is. But when it comes to being held accountable, you've received more. I expect more from you. To whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. He, he goes on to even men do this. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Even men do this. Yeah, if, the, if the manager of the company pays you $5,000 a week, uh -huh. he expects more out of you than the fellow that gets $300 a week. Uh -huh. I mean, who doesn't know this? Yeah. Yeah. Why do they do that? Because that's, that's an intelligent principle. Uh -huh that's been developed by people made in the image of God. This is how God is. Amen. Amen. 
So you, it's just not a matter of you learning a lot and having a good knowledge base, a wide not base of knowledge. That's not. You are expected to produce a whole lot more than generations before Amen. Jesus. Expects that of you because he knows what he gave you. That's right. Now, if he just gave indiscriminately, well, then how could he expect different things from different yes. people? But God knows exactly what he gave you. That's right. And Christ knows exactly what he's worked in you. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. He expects, if he's worked a lot in you, then he expects a lot from you. See, manifold transgressions. Yeah. You know I said manifold. Manifold because you've been given more, and so there's all kind of branches of. Yeah these transgressions. And how about this for a description? I know your mighty sins. Is that, that, that's some expression. Mighty sins. Other versions read, how strong are your sins? Do a version says, grievous sins. Your sins are great. Your many rebellious acts. How outrageous are your sins? When the depth of your rebellion, how countless your sins. See, they had a hard time translating this, I can see. It's hard to find the English word that really says it. The lexical meaning of mighty is powerful by implication numerous. See, but yet it doesn't really, <laughs> really doesn't tell you much. It's a concept that there isn't really any word in our language that really says it adequately. Now, there's a, there's a two-fold sense. You have to expound it, in other words. It's a two-fold sense in which sins can be mighty. First, they're like an assault against God himself. That's what sin is. Sin is like a, a war being declared against God. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be one. I understand that, but it's a vain assault, but it's a tempted one. See, they're endeavoring to overthrow the rule of God. Let us break his bands asunder. See, that's, that's mighty sin. <laughs> Still people trying to do that, incidentally. And the more a sin gets a grip on a person, the more rebellious they become. Sin, sin warps what a person is. Morphs, he morphs into something worse. That's what sin does, it's mighty. Sin is mighty, strong. Those things you wouldn't imagine. These people that end up emaciated and looking like walking death, they didn't imagine that alcohol and smoking could do that. Sin's mighty. Person walking around with the HIV. He did. He didn't know how mighty sin was. See, those are physical manifestations of what happens when sin makes an entrance. It's strong. Make no mistake about this. When sin enters in, it's strong. It has the power to break down certain barriers and make the person do things they wouldn't normally do. Yes. To, to prove that point, look what it did from the first sin, death. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Person in the grip of sin, they don't think God sees it. See, God has said, I see your I see your manifold transgressions. But the person in the grip of sin, he doesn't know that. Here's how here's how he'll think. Ezekiel eight twelve. The Lord seeth not. That's how the <laughs> sin will make a person think like this. Eliaphaz spoke of a man who said, How doth God know? The psalmist wrote that the wicked reason in his heart, God hath forgotten, he hideth his face, he'll never see it. He, he also said that Israel reasoned, God shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Isaiah braided Israel, woe to them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us? Who knoweth us? He? That's mighty sin. You read something like this and say, what? That's, that's downright stupid. But sin can make a person think like that. God doesn't see this. Come on now. God's great God. He's not going to look down on me and see me doing this. 
He's not going to see me sneaking out here yep. to one of these nightclubs. Huh? He won't see me. That's mighty sin. Yeah. See, that's the condition Amos is addressing. Israel may be convinced they're living independently from God, but they are not. And neither are we. Amen. Some sinners glibly say, and some that have come from our own number have said it. I, I don't believe in God anymore. That's how mighty sin is. Yes. How much, it'd be pretty hard to say something more stupid than that. Yeah. Uh -huh. The issue is whether God recognizes you or not. That's the issue. Yes. Amen. And what do you do, he says? You afflict the just, or the, the righteous ones, you take a bribe so you could corrupt judgment. You say, I'll, I'll rule your way. Give me, give me a, so much and I'll rule, I'll rule in your favor. And they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. They have something they can have you turn them aside. See, all of these things, they did this. I see that you did it, God said. Israel staggered at Staggered on, and they were spiritually inebriated. They were staggering through life like a drunk man. They continued to make life difficult for the just. Haven't you experienced this? People will try and make it difficult for you because you're godly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they took bribes so the guilty to go free and then pushed the poor out of the way. You see? Every one of these things were driven by selfishness. Every one of these sins are the direct result of self-interest, of building a life around yourself. Every one of these. But sin can convince a person that I, life was I only go around once. I want to get all I can. Mighty sins. When self becomes man's prominent consideration, it inevitably leads to manifold yeah. sins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can see the, uh, yeah. the sense of this text. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable reasoning, and, and you can accept it and base your thinking on these principles that have been made known. God knows. Amen. I know. I see what you've been doing. Yeah. If it's good, that's that's good favor. Yes, yes. He's not unrighteous to forget your work of faith and labor of love. So, but what, whether you're doing good or evil, God, God sees it. Amen. You think about it. Good when you go to sleep at night to address your prayers to God and uh -huh. just confess. I know that you've been watching me all day, Lord. Yeah. And kind of review your life with that uh, in mind. Yes, you know, saying, um, "I can see here. I need to. Uh, I need more grace in this area. I didn't too didn't do too well there today. But I see I made some progress here, and I'm giving you the thanks and the praise yes, for it. Yes. See, when you know, when you when you know, God knows. It changes. Yes, amen, it changes how you live." I think that's all I have. Any of you have something you want to say tonight? Yes, Sister Tasha? You had made this uh, uh, point that whenever people remain in sin, they, they forget what God had given them prior to their sin. And it's because these things are precious to the Lord, and he will not allow for them to be squandered by people who don't love the truth. Uh -huh. yeah. And so he'll remove that. He'll, yeah. erase, he'll erase their memory of these things. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, they are something. Yeah, the sin really doesn't have what we might say a sta status quo. That's where it's true. like that's, that's yeah, just that's enough good. you can just kind of idle. Mm -hmm. that, uh, Peter used a phrase that reminds me of the, of this of the text he taught tonight. It says they have a heart exercised with covetous practices. Very good. It's like they, they, they advance 
in their covetousness. Very good. Like Paul said, that they were inventors of evil things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like what what they had uh, at any any given time wasn't enough, so they mm -hmm. invented more ways to yeah. be evil, more ways to cover, yeah. more ways to commit. And that, that is not just like a, an exceptional case. That's the way of sin. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. Yeah, yes, Paul talked about going from bad to worse. Oh, Paul talked about going from bad to worse. That's to get right. Worse and worse. Worse and, yeah, yeah evil men to worse and worse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jason? Very instructive to read the, the gospel accounts and how certain people responded to Jesus because... That's a little window into how people respond to God. Jesus was God in the flesh. That's right. And you, you just take note as you as you read through the Gospels there. There were people, most of the people that came to Jesus were poor people, sick people, ordinary people like fishermen, mm -hmm. the rich people, powerful people, religious people didn't like Jesus. Mm. It's just a pattern. You threw it's almost. That's right. It's almost consistent through there. Amen. That there, with, with very few exceptions, anybody who was in a position of power, religious or secular, yeah. anybody who had a lot of money. Remember, Jesus told a young man, he That's said, right. he says, one thing you lack, sell everything you had. And the man, he went away sad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Jesus' main enemies were Pharisees and Sadducees yeah. and scribes and the teachers of the law, professional religious people. One time it said, Jesus was teaching about money. It says, and they sneered at him yeah, at because him. they loved money. He's yeah. talking about the religious That's leaders right. That's right. that love money. It's just it's it's interesting to see how these different people responded responded to Jesus. Amen. And it's a it's a window see into this principle that Amos is talking about of the people of his day. It's the same human nature hasn't changed a bit. They were threatened by Jesus. Yes. Yeah. And it's like the prophets threatened them. You know? On this uh, manifold transgressions and mighty sins, I get kind of an image of, if you look at the top of a building, it seems pretty simple and confined, but underneath there's a whole structure. Uh -huh. There's a lot of components that make up that building. Yeah. There are yeah. a lot of bricks laid in that building. There are a lot of rooms in that building. It has a purpose and a function. And that this image of manifold transgressions, it's from one perspective, you know, it might just be evidenced as mistreating the poor. But behind all of that are all these sins stacked up Amen. carefully on top of one another that are bringing about this manifestation. Amen. Mm -hmm. And it erects this mighty structure yeah. Amen. that Good. holds Good. up these uh, this idolatry, really. It's, yeah. it's, it's Good. a building Amen. of idolatry. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. 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 I was reminded of Zacchaeus gladly receiving Jesus into his home. And when he arrived, he stood up and said, Lord, half my possessions I give to the poor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. saying, and if I've wronged anyone, I'll pay it back four times. Yeah. Yeah. So he drew near to the Lord and it changed him. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 Amen. There's a lot to be said, too, about the people that are treating the poor in this way. More than likely, they began in a similar situation. At one point, they had experienced something like the poor were experiencing. And so, that there's even more guilt associated with someone who has tasted of the experience and then treats the people with contempt that were in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say there's, even, there's a lot of depth in this as we're talking about it because I, we have personal testimony of this Kenny, Kenny Copeland. He, um, there was a lady that we studied with in Georgia that went to, to one place that we went that was, we were studying with before we moved. And she would send a lot of money. Well, she didn't have hardly any money, but she sent money to this man. She felt like she had to all the time. And she couldn't even pay her bills. And there were saints in the church giving her money. So see how this was stacking on top of each other. They were giving her things, paying her utility bills and all. And she's sending money to, to Kenny Copeland. 
And he even uh, had, like, I guess he hires people to do things for him. I'm sure he does. They called her and told her there was going to be a, tornado, a hurricane or something hit her house. Remember mm -hmm. that? Remember us talking about that? We couldn't remember what preacher it was. It was him yeah. that had did that. Called her and said that he could pray that away from her house. Mm -hmm. So these kind of things is building up. It's disgusting. Yes. Yeah. We'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the prophet Amos. We thank you for his spiritual stamina and his faithfulness. We rejoice that he finished his course well and that he's been written up in the books in order for it's a man of faith. We desire to emulate him, be like him. In Jesus' name, amen.